Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this is part one of the recorded lecture on the British Empire in America. And in this lecture, we're going to be covering the uh, settlement of the southern colonies, so uh, North and South Carolina, as well as Georgia, and then the middle colonies of uh, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, and uh, Delaware. And so um, we've in previous lectures, we've talked about the Chesapeake colonies, which are Virginia, Maryland, which are part of the Southern colonies, but they started first and kind of developed distinctly originally from uh, the Carolinas and Georgia. And then we also cover the New England colonies with the Puritans and the Pilgrims in another lecture as well. So I introduced the Navigation Acts before, uh, but before the French Indian War, the Seven Years' War, whichever one you want to use it, some of the newer textbooks are calling it the War for Empire. Uh, but basically, um, the British did not enforce the Navigation Acts. They wanted the, the English colonies to only trade with Great Britain, uh, but they're not enforcing that. Uh, because with mercantilism, it's how much gold and silver uh, is in your treasure equals power. You always want to buy more than you, uh, or you always want to sell more than what you end up purchasing. So you want to export more than you import. And um, colonies are there to benefit the mother country. Well, if New York is trading with the Dutch, that's not benefiting the mother country. So that's why the, the British Parliament passed the Navigation Acts, but they're preoccupied with problems in Europe, so they don't really enforce them before the Seven Years' War. All right. So um, when Charles II came to English throne in 1660, uh, England was a second-class trading country and was far behind the much more efficient Dutch, which is the Netherlands. Uh, the English government passed a series of, of Navigation Acts, which we talked about, to try to uh, um, keep the colonies from trading with uh, on Dutch ships because, you know, if, if, if the Dutch were, were FedEx and the British ships were UPS, FedEx was cheaper than UPS, all right? And by the 1720s, the recently unified kingdom of Great Britain, comprising of uh, England and Scotland, had taken control of commerce in the Atlantic. To protect the empire's viable West Indian, Indian sugar colonies from European rivals, the Dutch in New Netherland, the Spanish in Mesoamerica and Florida, and especially the Catholic French in Quebec and the West Indies, British ministers repeatedly went to war and with considerable success. Eventually, Britain would try to enforce the Navigation Acts in North America, but with little success. Um, but over time, the British colonies in North America are going to be more and more profitable. And after they're broke, after the French Indian War and the Seven, Year, or the Seven Years' War, whichever one you want to call it, they're going to be enforcing those Navigation Acts because they need that money. All right, so let's look at the Southern colonies. Um, <clears throat> so when Charles II came to the throne in 1660, he quickly established a, a string of new colonies that historians would call the Restoration Colonies, for whatever reason, um, mainly because he was kind of restoring the, the crown after the uh, uh, revolution where uh, uh, Oliver Cromwell had taken over. I went blank on his name for a second. Um, he gave eight aristocrats a gift of Carolina, which would later split in North and South Carolina. South Carolina was wealthy. North Carolina was kind of more poor, former indigenous servants. They get a little bitter at the wealthy landowners of South Carolina break away. Um, he also granted a huge tract of land to his brother, James, the Duke of York, uh, once he uh, uh, took it from the New Netherlands um, in, in present day New York. Um, also, the king gave uh, uh, him New Jersey as well. And like Lord Baltimore's Maryland, their new colonies were proprietorships, which means they're, all, they're run and started by one individual. The aristocrats owned all the land and could rule as they wished as long as their laws conformed broadly to those of England. Uh, most proprietors envisioned a traditional European society presided over by the gentry and the Church of England. Okay, so let's look at the actual Carolinas themselves. Okay, um, so for the most part, they're pretty fertile land. Uh, they really, when they establish them, hope for kind of a manorial system like uh, Europe, so like a manor with uh, tenants and then a noble. Yeah, right. This is the United States. We don't really, uh, uh, well, in, in the becoming the United States, you don't really have that kind of old school medieval Europe kind of way. The first settlers in North Carolina were, were primarily poor families and runaway servants from Virginia and equality minded English Quakers. OK, so they want equality. That's why they're going to break away. Um, and we'll, we'll get to the Quakers here a little bit when we talk about the founding of Pennsylvania. Refusing to work on these large landers or plantations, whatever you want to call them. The settlers raided corn, uh, hogs, okay, which was one of the main sor force, uh, uh, sources of protein, and tobacco on, on really kind of modest family farms. These are yeoman farms. They're not working for anybody. They own a small tract of land, not extremely wealthy or anything like that. North Carolina was finally separated from South Carolina in 1712. 
Uh, Virginia and South Carolina had a ruling aristocracy, while North Carolina was more poor. Okay. Now, due to colonial resistance, the proprietors had to abandon their dreams of a feudal society. Many of the white settlers of South Carolina were migrants from the overcrowded Sugar Island of Barbados. Now, Barbados is down in the Caribbean. It was a very famous sugar island, but, but land was tough to come by in Barbados, and it was a British sugar uh, island, just like Jamaica. And so um, some, some wealthy sugar planters decided, you know what, maybe we can get a fresh start in a different part uh, with more land than what we are landlocked in Barbados. So they go to South Carolina in 1670. Uh, and, and that's, it's interesting because that's going to start a precedence. These wealthy plantation owners, uh, South Carolina is going to have uh, plantations all the way until the civil war. They're going to be the state that secedes from the union, um, had a majority African slave population and a smaller white population. And kind of, uh, even though they originally had more whites um, than blacks, of course, there's going to be more Native Americans initially. Uh, but over time, as they develop these large plantations, they're going to have um, end up having more and more slaves than even the white population. North Carolina, on the other hand, which actually what did not secede initially, uh, was in the second round of secession in the Civil War. Um, they had uh, counties in North Carolina that remained loyal to the Union because they were in the Appalachian Mountains. And they were a little more, uh, not quite as wealthy uh, as South Carolina. Okay. Now, one of the things, the Carolina merchants also opened a lucrative trade with the uh, neighboring Indian peoples by exchanging e English manufacturers for deer skins. Between 1699 and 1715, 54,000 deer skins exported per year on average. Indians traded captives, okay, so they actually traded Native American uh, slaves for goods, uh, guns, and rum. This trading changed their, uh, the way of life for the natives. Indian tribes began enslaving uh, other tribes to trade with the English. They, they basically enslaved rival tribes just to get sweet English goods from them. Okay. Um, the, the English uh, sent these, these natives to Boston, New York, or the West Indies. Um, but nonetheless, they end up adopting African slaves as a lot of the Native American slaves died off from disease. Um, unfortunately, though, the Carolinas' reliance on slave labor led to their Indian trading partners to take captives from other Native American peoples and exchange them for alcohol and guns. By 1708, white Carolinas were working their coastal plantations with about 1,400 Indian and about 2,900 African slaves, and brutal Indian warfare continued in the backcountry. Um, and really, South Carolina remained a violent frontier settlement until the 1720s, uh, so not pleasant. Now let's look at Georgia. Georgia was the last of the 13 colonies founded. Uh, it was actually founded for two reasons. One, it was... Um, founded as a buffer state between South Carolina and Spanish Florida. So that way, if the Spanish or the uh, Native Americans within Florida, such as the Creeks or Cherokees, uh, just to the, to the west of them, if they attack, they would kill the Georgian settlers and not the South Carolinian settlers. Um, the second thing is they wanted to um, found it as a colony for debtors. So if you couldn't pay back your debts and you defaulted on your debts, you went to a debtor's prison. And so they brought former debtors to Georgia to settle. And, and so those would be the ones that would get killed, not the South Carolinians um, and so forth. Now, um, land holdings in Georgia were limited to only 500 acres, which is a lot, of, a lot of land today. Rum was prohibited and the importance of slaves was forbidden, partly to leave room for servants brought on charity, partly to ensure security. These rules soon failed by 1759. So during the Seven Years War, you end up bringing over slaves anyway. Population increased greatly after 1763, um, after the end of the Seven Years' War. Uh, Georgians exported, uh, exported rice, indigo, lumber, beef, and pork, and carried on a lively trade with the West Indies. And uh, James Oglethorpe ends up being the founder. He's kind of a famous Georgian guy. We'll talk about him when we get the War of Jenkins here. All right, so Virginia, we know it was founded from a previous lecture. Uh, joint Stock Company, looking to make a quick profit. Maryland was founded as a safe haven for Catholics. Uh, North and South Carolina was founded uh, by these wealthy uh, uh, plantation owners from Barbados, and then North Carolina breaks away, so uh, they were more independent from the wealthier South Carolina. And Georgia is founded as a buffer state and a uh, uh, debtor's prison colony. Okay, also, the British founded Australia for a penal colony, those that were gone to prison. So restoration colonies are the Carolinas, New York, and New Jersey. Okay. Pretty cool. You can read this information if you like. I'm going to go through this really quickly. So here's where Barbados is, uh, about 2,000 miles to what they call Charlestown. He was the king 
I mean, and he's one that gave that land grant. So they naturally named it after him. My, my parents have been to Charleston as well as Savannah, two beautiful coastal cities. North Carolina, founded, uh, breaks away from South Carolina. Now let's get to the middle colonies. These were pretty fascinating. They're the most diverse ethnically, the most diverse religiously, and the most, most diverse in their uh, economy. So the greatest part of diversity of the colonies is in the middle colonies. So it's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and a little small Delaware. Okay, so um, let's look at Pennsylvania first. It was actually founded by William Penn. Um, he was a Quaker. A Quaker uh, was a, a Protestant religious group that didn't believe there should be slavery, um, didn't believe in warfare. They were pacifists, um, and they were uh, uh, believed that they should justly um, treat the Native Americans and, and pay them for their land and so forth. And so uh, William Penn was given this land grant from the king, and he actually advertised his uh, colony uh, throughout Europe and even printed it in German. And actually, Pennsylvania is going to have several, uh, quite a few German settlement settlers that come there, as well as Scots-Irish. Okay. Now, you may be wondering, who are the Scots-Irish? Um, these are um, immigrants. Well, they're, they, they, the British crown, when they conquered Ireland, took Scottish lowlanders and settled them in Northern Ireland to try to turn Ireland Protestant, which is why Northern Ireland is Protestant today. And they don't quite get along with uh, the rest of Ireland, who is probably Catholic. Um, and so Scots-Irish are basically Scottish lowlanders who happened to move from Ireland. They weren't well liked in Ireland, which is why they want to come over here to the uh, American 13 colonies. I have a little Scots-Irish uh, blood in me from my dad's side. So um, anyway, so Pennsylvania was founded as a safe haven for Quakers. Okay, So you've got Massachusetts. Connecticut and New Hampshire and Rhode Island all founded with, well, New Hampshire, Connecticut really just Puritans spilling over into those areas. Rhode Island's founded for religious reasons. Um, and you have Maryland for Catholics. They're founded for religious reasons. So very much an important part of American history. Okay. The Quakers also <coughs> refused to <coughs> serve in the military or pay taxes to the Church of England, which is why they were persecuted. And they fled to uh, North America. Quakers rejected Calvinism of the Puritans, and their leaders were George Fox and Margaret Fell, as they thought that God had given all men and women an inner light of grace or understanding. Penn's frame of government, 1681, ensured religious freedom by prohibiting a legally established church and it promoted political equality by allow, allowing all property owning men to vote and hold office. Now, back in the day, the fact that voting was really revolutionary, and, uh, and certainly if they did have voting, you had to own property, uh, but Penn continued that. These provisions prompted thousands of Quakers, mostly Yaman farm families from northwestern England, to come to Pennsylvania. Initially, they settled along the Delaware River near the city of, of Philadelphia, which Penn himself laid out in a grid with wide main streets and many parks. To attract European Protestants, Penn published pamphlets in Dutch and German and promised cheap land and freedom from religious persecutions. Critics called it Penn's Woods and so forth. Um, in 1683, Germans established a settlement called Germantown, outside of Philadelphia, and thousands of Germans soon followed. Ethnic diversity, pacifism, and freedom of conscience made Pennsylvania the most open and democratic of the Restoration colonies. So that and Rhode Island were, were very, uh, very religiously free, and so forth. All right, so New York was uh, taken over by the Dutch, originally a Dutch settlement, and uh, uh, was given as a land grant from uh, King Charles II to uh, the Duke of York. Also, uh, Jersey was given, and then Jersey is kind of split between two brothers. You have East and West Jersey, and eventually it becomes one colony. Uh, Delaware kind of uh, spilled out uh, from Jersey and, and uh, Pennsylvania. At one point, uh, for a while in colonial history, Delaware was part of uh, the Pennsylvania government. Okay. Now, so if you look right here, I love this map. It shows you the melting pot. Um, you see the areas where African slaves are brought in. You see where the Dutch had settled. Okay, you see where a lot of English came. German primarily coming uh, to Pennsylvania and along the Appalachians. You see where the Scotch-Irish settle, also along the Appalachians. The Scots and a little small settlement of Swedes in New Jersey. They introduced the log cabin uh, in American history. And uh, also the Welsh. A lot of them go to the south. Okay. So New York, like I said, given as a land grant restoration colony from uh, the King of England, okay, New Jersey, and uh, another uh, restoration colony, uh, 
given to Lord John Berkeley and Sir George Cataret, Pennsylvania, land grant by the king, safe haven for the Quakers. Okay. Also, the Swedes, some, some uh, Swedish people settled there. And of course, we know Maryland was founded for religious reasons, safe haven for the Catholics. Here's a painting of William uh, Penn. Remember, Quakers, they didn't like paying taxes, didn't want to serve in the military. That's why they get, ta they get uh, targeted. All right. It's actually the Royal Land Grant, what it looked like. It's a painting of William Penn uh, signing, purchasing land from Native Americans uh, and so forth. He believed that they should be justly compensated. This is his actual treaty. Okay. Called it a holy experiment. So religious freedom, baby. Got to love it. All right. Mercantilism. I've gone over this. Three things. You always want to sell more than what you buy. How much gold and silver you have in your treasury equals your, your country's power. And you always, uh, um, colonies are there to benefit the mother country. Okay. So were they enforced in navigation acts before the seven years war? No. Okay. Um, and so they didn't want to pay those, uh, those taxes with navigation acts. They made it where you had to go try, uh, ship your stuff on a British ship, send all the way back to England, pay a tax and then ship it to its destination. Well, who wants to do that? Okay. Um, so that's why they end up not, uh, complying by those laws. Okay. So I've kind of emphasized that they, they kind of bribe customs officials out of it. And, uh, eventually Massachusetts Bay gets punished for not abiding by it. Okay. One of the things too, in the, in the late 1600s, the Dutch were dominating the slave trade in, in, um, uh, in Africa. And so in the 1700s, the British are going to dominate it and so forth. All right. Now, New York did have these big land estates because that's how the Dutch established it. The English kind of continued that uh, because they inherited it from the Dutch. And uh, but that changes over time as more and more people come and settle in New York. That's what New York, New York Harbor looked like back in 1639. It's changed quite a bit. It's what it looked like when it was under the Dutch. In fact, my favorite president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, was actually uh, a descendant of Dutch settlers uh, in the 1600s. Yes, and Wall Street actually was a wall of their fort at one point. Okay. So the Dutch uh, had a brief time in New York, about 50 years, fur trading establishment. Remember that? Okay. Uh, eventually um, angered a lot of the uh, Native Americans. And it kind of got forgotten by the Dutch West Indies Company. Okay. So we talked about New Jersey. And uh, there's Charles II who gave the Carolinas, New York, and Jersey, and also... Uh, you got uh, William Penn of Pennsylvania. Now let's talk about uh, the Dominion of New England. Now James II was an aggressive and uh, inflexible ruler. He instructed the Lords of Trade to subject the American colonies to strict royal control. Basically, they've been having what's called solitary neglect. Solitary neglect means that you're you're preoccupied with something else, and you're getting away. The colonies are getting away with kind of govern themselves. It's kind of like if your parents were. Uh, when you were growing up as a kid and uh, they're in the kitchen working about something and you're able to kind of do whatever you want in the living room because they're not paying attention to you. That's what solitary neglect is. All right. In 1686, the Lords revoked the corporate charters of Connecticut and Rhode Island and merged them with the Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies to form a royal province known as the Dominion of New England. They hated it. Okay. Sir Evan Andros was appointed as a governor there. He was one of the most hated men in the colonies. Two years later, James II added New York and New Jersey to the Dominion, creating a vast colony that stretched from Maine to the Delaware River. James II imposed absolutist rule in the entire Dominion by ordering Governor Andros to abolish the existing legislative assemblies. In Massachusetts, Andros immediately banned town meetings, angering villagers who prized uh, local self-rule. He also advocated public worship in the Church of England, offending Puritan congregationalists. The governor challenged all land titles, um, uh, granted under the original Massachusetts Bay Charter, uh, and so forth. And so the Dominion of New England, it, it basically, here's a couple things to, to remember. Okay, if you remember these two things, you got it. It unites the New England colonies along with New York and, and Jersey. Okay, the reason why they want to exert greater control over the colonies. Does it work? No. Does it last for long? No. And the colonies hated it. They eventually get rid of it when uh, King James II is removed from power in the Glorious Revolution. Okay.
Now, the uh, England had kind of gone back and forth between Catholics and Protestants and so forth. James II was um, um, a Catholic, and um, he also had a Catholic son and didn't want, uh, the Parliament didn't want them to go back to Catholicism like it had under uh, Queen Mary, um, who had been very ruthless uh, towards Protestants. This had happened previously. So they had a glorious revolution where it's it basically it's peaceful. James II gets removed from power. Uh, William III of Orange and his wife come in. And um, so there's no bloodshed, unlike uh, with the uh, Puritan revolt with Oliver Cromwell. Okay, so Glorious Revolution, you got Protestants back on the throne, demanding of New, Re New England, see ya. Okay. Now, um, so one of the things is uh, the uh, King William and Queen uh, Mary, uh, another Mary, not uh, Mary, the one that was a Catholic, they uh, are write a, a Declaration of Rights in 1689, the English Bill of Rights, and later the uh, Bill of Rights looks very similar to the English Bill. Now let's look at uprisings in Massachusetts and Maryland. They're caused by the Glorious Revolution. Uh, more immediately, the Glorious Revolution sparked rebellions by Protestant colonists in Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York. When the news of the coup, which I guess you call it a coup, they basically came second to fled the country, uh, reached Boston in April of 1689. Puritan leaders, supported by 2,000 militiamen, seized Governor Andros uh, and accused him of Catholic sympathies. Remember, they hated Edmund Andros and shipped him back to England. The new English monarchs broke up the Dominion of New England said see ya, but created the combined royal colony of Massachusetts that included Plymouth and Maine. The, this is where Massachusetts is established from then on. Okay, The colony's charter empowered the king to appoint the governor and customs official. It also gave the vote to all male property owners, not just Puritan church members. So this is where they get rid of, you had to be a member of the church to vote. Uh, that is no more after this. And so you can see the Puritan hold on society is not as much. Now, does that mean that people are going to be banned in their congregationalist church? Absolutely not. Okay, um, so it just means it's not going to be a theocracy as, as, anymore. Now, in Maryland, it was more economic and religious uh, that led to an uprising. Tobacco prices had fallen and it hurt small farmers who were mostly Protestant. And they were resentful of rising taxes and the high fees imposed by, two, by who were primarily Catholics. When James II was removed, 700 Protestants forcibly removed the Catholic governor. The Lords of Trade suspended Lord Baltimore's proprietorship and imposed royal government and made the Church of England the legal religion of the colony. The arrangement lasted until 1715 when Benedict Calvert, the fourth Lord Baltimore, converted to the Anglican faith, and the king restored the proprietorship uh, to the Calvert family. Okay. There's also a rebellion. This is the only painting I, I, I've ever been found on, on, online of Jacob Lesser. I actually really have no idea if this is actually accurate. So let's pretend it looks like him, uh, whether it does or actually not. I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, but in New York, Jacob Lesler led a rebellion against the Dominion of New England uh, once James II was gone. Um, led by Leisler, the Dutch militia ousted Lieutenant Governor Nicholson, an Andros appointee, an alleged Catholic sympathizer. You can tell there's a lot of tensions between Protestants and Catholics after that uh, Protestant and Catholic reform, uh, reformations. Um, uh, um, what ends up happening after Leisler imprisoned 40 of his political opponents, he was convicted by an English jury and hung because he was basically going after his enemies, not exactly uh, people that were in government. And because the king and queen wanted support against Catholic France, they allowed the Dominion of New England to dissolve and let those colonies have self-rule. Hmm. And they're used to that self-rule when uh, uh, in the years before the American Revolution. Parliament created the Board of Trade in 1696 to supervise the American settlements, but had limited success. Settlers and proprietors resisted the board's attempt to install royal governance in every colony, as did many English political leaders who feared an increase in monarchical power. The result was another period and lax administration. The home government cut the high duties on West Indian sugar instituted by James II and imposed only a few laws and taxes on mainland settlements. It allowed local merchants and financiers to develop their sources of trade. Okay. Now we're going to get to uh, imperial wars in part two, a uh, very important topic.